All right, everyone, great to have you all here. Thanks so much for joining the Fight Back Power Hour April edition today. My name is Tim, I'm your host for tonight. And yes, it's time for the Power Hour, as you can see. I'm super excited about this one. And well, why is that? Well, that's because of two reasons. Number one is that I would love not only to welcome all our existing members of Fight Back already here, uh, but especially also our new ones who are joining us here today for the very first time. Welcome, great to have you with us. And number two is actually because we have a packed agenda today with some stellar guests, but house rules first. As always, this is your event, especially today. So please, whenever you have comments or questions, please use the chat, raise your hand, share your thoughts. We follow the Chatham house rule here in these sessions. So whatever you want to mention, whatever kind of question you have, please share them with us to stimulate the conversation here in the group. And yes, we will have some Q&A sessions today. So please shoot your questions right in the chat or simply unmute yourself and just speak up. Also, please make sure you are locked in with the Zoom app to participate in the networking sessions later at the end of the event. All right. To kick off, I would like to quickly guide you through today's agenda, but also tell you again who we are and why we are here together at Fight Back. So what is Fight Back? Fight Back is an international community of about 300 top decision makers and innovators. Just look around you. We have already in the room CEOs, board members, unicorn founders, entrepreneurs, investors, academics, and Ivy League professors. And we all have the goal to actually foster a cross-industry and cross-border exchange in order to accelerate the transition towards a healthy planet. And why is that important? Well, because our global challenges continue to become more interconnected. They are getting bigger. And that's why we believe it's so important to offer a neutral platform to enable the transfer of knowledge, identify synergies, and spark collaborative interaction between you, the members. And what makes us special? Well, all our community members are actually handpicked. Each of us here acts as a private individual to maintain an open, proactive exchange outside of our daily corporate borders and regulations that we're struggling with here now. And this will actually break new grounds for a sustainable and healthy future in an unprecedented way. And to me, this is very inspiring. I'm so happy to have you all here today sharing the same mindset. All right, let's go into today's agenda. Today, we have prepared several highlights for you with inspiration, best practices, opportunities, insights, and for sure, matchmaking. And I will start with sharing an update about the organization and the community, as well as our special campaign for Earth Day. Then we will go into our first best practice, talking about the phenomenal story of the Loop Alliance with Brian. We will then welcome our special guest of tonight, Mr. Daniel Croft, to talk about the future of health and medicine. And then we will deep dive into the topic of green hydrogen and a special opportunity for you waiting there for you, together with our community member, Vaitea. And then we will finish the session as usual with our renowned networking session to get you connected with like-minded leaders here in the group. All right. So the first announcement of tonight is actually Earth Week is coming up. And if you heard and heard about this, right, on April 22, there will be a global party going on, which is called Earth Day. And at Fight Back, we also want to speak up as a community and show our commitment to the world that we care and that we want to make a difference. And for this, we have set up a special campaign for you to get Earthified. And it's very, very simple to participate. Step one is please visit bit.ly slash Earthified to visit the campaign page. There, you verify your Fight Back pro uh, profile by just filling in a very, very short form. It really just takes a minute to do so. We will then send you your personalized Earthified badge within the next 24 hours. Yes, we do so. And on April 22, we will all share and post our Earthified badge with a powerful message on our social media channels. But the, the, the idea here basically are limitless. What else you could do with your badge? Yeah? I mean, you could put it also on your email signature if you want. You can make it your screensaver. You can print it out, just put it on your working desk. You can see it all the time. Or wherever you want to use it afterwards. Yeah? The most important thing is really to get started and participate in the campaign by following step number one. Please go to the campaign page, bit.ly slash earthified, and just uh, fill in the profile there. And the best actually would be if you would do this within the next hour, maybe, yeah? Here you also see in the chat, we have the link, just go ahead there. 
All right. The second one is actually um, that some of you reached out to me and saying it's sometimes quite hard to follow with all the things going on at Fight Back. And uh, if, if we don't have like one page or something where we have an overview. So we decided to actually set up such a website for members only where you can see all the important information, including latest special announcement, event dates, also event recordings, a proper overview of all the members, the newsletters we send out every Friday, and also the direct link to the Fightback Slack channel if you miss it along the way. And the goal here is really to have all the information in one structured place. And you can find it at bit.ly slash Fightback Insights. And I've also in, uh, highlighted this link in all the Slack channels on the very top in the channel description. So you can't miss it basically. Well, I really hope this makes things easy for you in the future to navigate and stay up to date on all the things happening. Good, then let's move on to our first speaker tonight. I said we have a packed agenda. I would like to welcome Brian to the stage, the executive director at the TerraCycle Global Foundation who will share the phenomenal story of the Loop Alliance and how they established a circular model that we were talking about a lot actually in the past, right? More, uh, circular models. And they were focusing on eliminating plastic waste. Brian, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. The stage is yours. Here you go. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, absolutely wonderful to be here and a uh, pleasure to be connected with all of you here on the line. Um, as Tim mentioned, uh, really excited to share with you a bit of the story, very briefly, uh, uh, on kind of how we developed this beautiful business called Loop. Uh, Loop is uh, a new enterprise created by an organization called TerraCycle. Uh, I've had the honor and privilege to uh, be involved in the ideation uh, of Loop, uh, leading to its development and growing expansion um, across the world. So, Tim, if you don't mind, just moving to the next slide, please. Uh, Loop was an organization founded by this very interesting company called TerraCycle, uh, a company that's been around for 20 years with a laser focused mission on eliminating the idea of waste. Uh, we're a company that has been operational in 22 countries across the globe and historically specializing in the recycling of hard to recycle materials. Um, next slide, please. Um, over these 20 years, we've learned a lot about consumer goods, we've learned a lot about circular economy, and we decided to ask ourselves the question, you know, what is eventually going to put us out of business? And uh, we came to the conclusion that, uh, you know, we think that uh, reusable packaging has a very promising future and is really the ultimate solution to fulfilling our mission of eliminating the idea of waste. So we created this concept called Loop. Uh, this was launched in 2019, uh, and the best way to view what this platform is, it, it's a, basically a platform that enables brands, retailers in the consumer good industry to transition away from a single-use packaging supply chain to a durable, reusable one. And um, as you can see here on the image, uh, this is a, a one image of uh, one of our brand partners, hagen -Dazs. Uh, basically selling its ice cream in a beautiful stainless steel reusable ice cream container that consumers can enjoy in multiple markets across the globe. Uh, next slide. Um, with Loop, uh, we've been successful at partnering with many of the world's largest CPG companies. Um, we've had a stellar announcement of this alliance in Davos in January of 2019. Uh, since then, uh, we've continued to accelerate our onboarding of new CPG companies, consumer product good companies, new retailers, expanding into new business verticals such as fast food uh, and uh, rapidly expanding into new markets. Uh, next slide. So how do we explain, how did we get to the, I guess, phase one of, of this, this very ambitious undertaking? Uh, and this is really what I, I hope to kind of you know, share my insights with you today. Uh, next slide. So uh, some of the quick learnings that, that we captured from you know, taking this, this bold idea that really just started off as a concept um, with us was really uh, these few bullet points that you see here on the screen. 
um, uh, you know, the first step with making the Loop Alliance successful was really convincing one brand partner to join with us, um, really selling them on the vision. And this was only possible really through the uh, decades of uh, partnership that we've had with this partner on the TerraCycle business, our parent company. Um, to further motivate uh, this one brand and, uh, and motivate others to join the Alliance, uh, we decided to strategically organize an exciting launch event uh, within a time frame that was realistic to achieve, but also a time frame that wasn't too distant into the future. Um, this was the Davos announcement, uh, a very high profile platform. Um, what we've noticed is that to secure uh, the attention of the brand partners we wanted, we needed a milestone that was attractive enough for these partners to join us on this um, ambitious journey with us to develop the platform itself. Uh, once news of the project, the vision, and the launch event became known, a very interesting phenomenon started emerging where many brands uh, wanted to basically join in on the alliance and uh, really you know, have a piece of, of the wonderful launch of the platform itself. And uh, this is really what you know, we call kind of a snowball effect emerging where uh, we've had uh, wonderful um, you know, business development efforts kind of really build upon that idea of having a very uh, high profile launch event in place. Um, for the actual launch event itself, um, one strategy and tactic that we deployed that we found very helpful was having partners that weren't fully uh, ready with their final reusable package to still be you know, at ease and, and have them have the opportunity to display digital renderings, for instance, uh, something that was more actionable, more um, executionable um, without, uh, you, know, uh, you know, being fully ready. So I think having some flexibility, making sure that um, you're, you're, you're positioning the partner favorably from a communications perspective and giving them that flexibility is a very important learning and, and lesson that we uh, uh, captured in uh, making this, this um, yeah, project a reality. And then finally, uh, given the fact that we were building a platform from scratch, again, we were a recycling company that really didn't have much experience in the reuse sector. Uh, we collaborated from a position of humility, uh, from a position of you know, good faith, but also um, you know, making sure that we were working exceptionally hard with our partners to successfully onboard in the platform and um, yeah, working in, in, in good partnership. So uh, those are my key lessons, uh, Tim, that, that we captured from Loop that I, I hope you can find some level of inspiration uh, for uh, the beautiful project that you're leading. And uh, if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask me following this meeting, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Brilliant. Here we have like contact details. Brian is also going to be on, on Slack for sure as well. So you can directly reach to, uh, out to him there. Um, yeah, anyone who has questions to Ryan. Now's the time. Just unmute yourself. Just speak up. Hi, I have a question. Sure. Um, super, super interesting work. And I think Loop has done a fantastic job also on getting the idea out there of reusable packaging, right? Of just get, you know, the, the sort of social media attention um, has been great. And yeah. I, I'd be curious to learn more about how the behind the scenes operation of the whole thing works, because I would guess that one of the big upsides or, or the, the key to making it work from a financial perspective and not just being, um, you know, marketing investment from the clients is the operations and really having operational excellence and things being standardized and the flows working well. But when I look at the products, each brand seems to be able to have different, um, sorry, I just realized my microphone was off. I hope you heard me. Um, that, that when I look at the, the different products, each brand seems to have a lot of flexibility to how the thing is formatted. Right. And if you, if you think about like old fashioned distribution systems or return systems, like um, for, for glass bottles that we used to have, one of the key topics there was always that everyone used the same glass bottle. So reuse was easy because everyone used the same one. So I, I'd just be curious to understand how the operations work. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, uh, uh, you know, a lot there in that question, but basically, uh, you know, for us, standardization is obviously very important, but through this initial phase of kind of getting consumers and getting these brands excited and making that pivot from single use to reusable, uh, we found it to be strategically very beneficial to give them some leeway on the design of their product and packaging. Um, you know, obviously, uh, there's a lot of brand equity at stake, and you know, brands, um, you know, are very focused on making sure that they can get consumers that uh, you know can see some level of brand differentiation. And uh, for that reason, uh, we decided to make sure that in this initial phase with Loop. Um, we engineer our cleaning systems to be able to accommodate a wide array of different packaging shapes, sizes, materials um, to really kind of accelerate excitement around what is potential when we transfer ownership of packaging away from a consumer over to a manufacturer where that package is no longer a cost of good, but in reality, now an asset. Uh, an asset that can actually be very exciting from not only an aesthetic standpoint, but also from a functionality standpoint. So uh, to help with that, you know, standardization in parallel, uh, you know, we partnered with some of the world's biggest logistics companies, such as DHL, FedEx, uh, on the cleaning front, uh, Ecolab. So really, you know, dealing with the world's largest and, uh, you know, best equipped organizations from an operational standpoint to really help us, um, you know, walk that, that, that fine line, that balance between, you know, beautiful product innovation and standardization. So um, that, that's kind of the, the, the approach that we took. Hope that answers your question, Caroline. Yes, thank you. All right, brilliant. Brian, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for sharing your wisdom here. And yeah, if there's more questions and so on, obviously you will be available. Um, just reach out to Brian, please. All right, thanks so much. Cool, absolutely fantastic. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Daniel Croft. Daniel is one of the most brilliant, potentially famous people on earth when it comes to health and medicine and talking about creating a positive future in this area. He is the founder of Exponential Medicine, chair member at the XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance Task Force, as well as a faculty chair member for medicine at Singularity University. And here he is uh, with us here tonight, live from California. It's an honor, Daniel. Welcome, the state is yours. Great to have you. Thank you. Great, good, good morning, good evening. I'm actually on the East Coast right now. First time traveling in about a year. Um, and I think if you let me share my slides, I will um, yes. try and we're gonna have just a, a quick blast about what's happening in the in the future of uh, of health and medicine. Then we'll have some time for a discussion and, and Q and A. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly because there's a lot going on. I just want to give you a little taste and you know how we can think collaboratively about uh, the future of health and medicine. Fight back in a sense and and think about you know human health is intimately tied to you know, one of your core missions around and global health in the environment and how uh, everything from rising sea levels to pollution to, to hot spots and fires really impact human health along the continuum. So thematically, you know, a lot is going on with kind of technology. Many of you on the call have, have helped invent and develop many technologies and put them together to sort of disrupt entire fields from how we do our banking to how we get our entertainment. And clearly, of course, uh, this year, um, uh, COVID has disrupted all our lives in, in many uh, horrible ways. Um, I think there's a bit of a, of a silver lining, however, because medicine has been sort of stuck in this third industrial age. And uh, COVID has been a bit of a catalyst to help push us forward into the fourth, right? Who led the digital transformation of your company or the, the transformation of healthcare, or the CEO, the CTO, or COVID-19. And COVID, uh, in a sense, has really opened our eyes to what's possible and helped, you know, just like Sputnik set off the space age, COVID is, COVID is sparking a bit of a, of a health age. Uh, and we've you know seen that in the acceleration of you know sequencing the virus to having the first vaccine into trials two months later to having you know now several proved uh, vaccines and the mRNA ones for example which will go on to impact many diseases from cancer to Alzheimer's uh, and beyond the sort of COVID application. You know so what's the future? Probably many of you when you think of healthcare and medicine you think about the four walls of a hospital, but really the the future of health and medicine is getting increasingly virtualized and digitized. We're going from you know hospital to home or hospital to home to all from from lab to laptop. That's been certainly catalyzed in the last year. But, you know, most of us, when we still experience healthcare day to day, we're still stuck, you know, with fax machines and paper forms, 
Uh, we're still um, getting you know CD-ROMs with information on it. I don't own a CD-ROM, but that's how I got my last study done. I was just in a procedure with my mother in DC yesterday. How many paper forms and stickers and other things, very kludgy elements kind of stuck in our past. And our opportunity is to get out of the past. You know, we're still using public health measures from 1918 or beyond uh, and to move forward out of the mindset of you know, sitting in waiting rooms or uh, the silos of how we design healthcare and biopharma and, and payers to get, uh, you know, and even the way we think about healthcare designed around body parts when we're really in this exponential connected age. So our opportunity for all of us is to reimagine from sort of what we really practice, sick care, to one of, of actual healthcare. What do, I, what do I mean by sick care? Sick care is sort of the way we've practiced medicine forever, very intermittent data. You only collect that in the four walls of the clinic when you visit your primary care doctor or the emergency room or the intensive care unit. And even if you do have a chronic disease, a common one like diabetes or hypertension, it's still hard to get your basic data to let's say your doctor or nurse. And the, and the, 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 the uh, ink outcome of that is we have a very reactive system. We tend to wait for the patient to show up with a, a heart attack or a stroke, or I'm an oncologist with late, with late stage cancers, or we wait for the pandemic arrive, to arrive on our shores. So that intermittent data reactive mindset leads to this challenge where we're moving. And I think it's starting to really start to unlock is to move to much more continuous data, whether it's from your connected wristwatch or home or environmental data to make that much more personalized to you, your community, much more proactive and to start to bring care arguably anytime, anywhere and democratize healthcare at the global level, bringing us better outcomes at lower cost. And to move the needle, not just to preventing disease or treating it better, but even think about truly personalized or optimized wellness, not just to live long lives. No one wants to be 120 and feel 120, but to think about optimizing our health span as well. So a lot's going on in the future of medicine. I wrote the cover story for NetGeo about a year ago. It's a great issue if you want to pick it up. But a bit of the thematic of that article and where things are heading is that things are moving, in some cases, exponentially. Many of the technologies that we live and breathe with, AI, blockchain, nanotech, low-cost genomics, are all moving very quickly. You know, We've seen exponentials in our day-to-day -day lives. Some of you remember growing up with a whole pile of technologies that have now been appified and digitized. That's starting to happen in medicine. You know, Our smartphone is not just for communicating and doing calls and telemedicine, it can be used as a diagnostic device. I'm really becoming medicalized. Everything from the microphone to uh, the, the cameras are being used for diagnostics and digital therapeutics. And so that means in many ways we can take our analog world and not just digitize, but do it in completely different ways where our tech is you know, dematerialized, appified, demonetized, essentially free, and can be democratized around the planet to impact uh, global health and personal health. So all this gives us a sort of uh, toolbox to reimagine health and medicine across the care continuum to think about kind of different areas, right? Health and prevention, staying healthy, not waiting for disease, doing an earlier job of diagnostics, doing therapy that's much more targeted and um, uh, personalized to, to speeding up cl clinical trials. So let's look at a few examples of what's happening. Uh, we now have the internet of medical things, writing 5G creates a tremendous amount of data. The challenge is to go from data to new insights and information and how to bridge that to you, the patient, the consumer, or to your clinician. There's still large gaps between learning something and becoming normative. We have an infodemic, too much information coming at us, whether that's you know, good information about vaccines or bad information from anti-vaxxers. And we also need to understand that technology, of course, is not the solution. We need to think about that in the setting of incentives. Are we going to pay for sick care? Are we going to pay for prevention? And some of the incentives, of course, are shifting to bring care from hospital to home, to our corner pharmacy, to our app. You know, how we practice and where we practice is shifting and it's becoming digitized, you know, connected, mobile, digital health is this new ability to integrate data and personalize that for the individual, for the uh, community health worker, for the hospital uh, or other system that ma matches their needs. And again, it's not just about digital, but all these technologies converging and super converging that gives us an opportunity to do that moving forward. Um, now, I've been lucky this last year to chair the XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance Task Force. Part of us is part of the Alliance's mission is to bring folks together from all sorts of fields and companies and organizations to not reinvent everything separately, but to collaborate. We've now helped accelerate things across the care continuum. And also to even address you know, the social determinants of health, which are so critical. Our zip code is more important than our, our genetic code. And we're learning, uh, particularly in the setting of the pandemic, about those disparities and how we might really address them, You know, making sure people have good access to education, clean water, vaccines, sleep, but also recognizing that there are you know, digital determinants of health. Do you have access to internet at all, let alone high-speed internet? Do you have access to a tablet? Is the communication in the right culture, lay, uh, culture or language? At Singular University, we've always had this aim of how do we address these grand challenges from the lens of accelerating technologies? Um, 
I built a program over the last decade called Exponential Medicine, which is it breaks open the silos and brings folks together from, I think we had 43 countries there with some amazing faculty from Ralph Simons on the call to Derek Topol and Craig Venture and the CEO of Moderna, for example. And part of the theme is not just about new tech, but how do we get out of our old mindsets? You know, this is a quote from Tony Young, the head of NHS Innovation. You know, the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but escaping from the old ones. So you can check out exponentialmedicine.com. There's lots of great talks there. We're going to have a virtual program before we get back to, to real life. Let's look at three areas quickly. And uh, Tim, give me a time check. So I'm going to probably be about three, four more minutes. Um, Take your what time. We can do with, yeah, what we can do with uh, health and prevention, right? We want to stay healthy and not wait for disease to get us. And we now know that, you know, most of our disease is based on our bad behaviors, not based on our genes. And now we're in an era, you know, only 12 years since the Fitbit launch where, you know, wearables are everywhere. I'm wearing four different versions. I'm sure many of you are wearing a wearable. And they're not just for consumer and counting steps anymore. They can start to measure almost every element of physiology and behavior uh, and can be even used in simple ways. If someone's discharged from the hospital with COVID or after a hip replacement, are they walking more or are they walking less? And can you pick up the people walking less and intervene early before they have a, a fall or a complication? Um, we're starting to shift from quantified self where the data just sits on our smartphones and watches and tablets to quantified health where it can flow to your doctor, nurse, pharmacist to use those digital biomarkers to optimize wellness to diagnose the disease early or to treat a disease, which is much more of a feedback mechanism. So lots of examples of things from wearables to incitables, you know, chips underneath the skin, lots of new ways to start to collect data, shockables, which can help change your behavior, hearables, which don't just listen, uh, play music, but can track vital signs, give you coaching, help someone who's got cognitive disabilities, you know, ringables, many of you know the aura ring that can help track your sleep, even underwearables, I've got one here, I won't show you the one I'm wearing, you know, these little internet and medical thing tags are so cheap now, you get a pack of 10 of these, Put them in your underwear band and uh, throw them in the laundry. They're always connected to your data. And now they've moved from consumer to medical because there's new in the, in the United States uh, payment codes for remote patient monitoring. So we can use these to track a patient with pneumonia or COVID uh, remotely and intervene hopefully early. Other wearables are fun, you know, for helping a paraplegic walk. Uh, the ultimate wearable from my uh, friend uh, Gravity is a, a wearable jet suit, which they're even looking at for using for emergency medical services to rescue folks in the mountains. I've had a chance to try and fly it. It's a little harder than it looks, but uh, that might be the ultimate wearable. Other quick things we can measure are food, you know, Hippocrates, so that food by the medicine, medicine be thy food. Now we can measure calories, uh, gluten, peanuts. We can measure output as well. Uh, the connected smart health enabled toilet is coming. And for many of you, even if you're not diabetic, you can now start to measure your responses to different meals. The idea of metabolomics is expanding. And I think we're gonna rapidly move to an era sort of much more precision, personalized nutrition, not fad diets, but ones that are really based on your diet, on your microbiome, your, your digitome uh, and beyond. Now, of course, we don't wanna be wearing things all the time. There's a new era of invisibles. Your camera can start to pick up your vital signs. So it's not a matter of wearing a, a patch or a, a, a ring, uh, lots of new ways to pick up elephants. Your voice can be a biomarker from your health for picking up early forms of Alzheimer's or autism or Parkinson's or even picking up the sound of a COVID cough versus a, a common cough. Smart speakers are starting to pick up vital signs, you know, just from your Amazon Alexa or from your Wi-Fi. So that starts to mean that our, our digital exhaust, our digitome is starting to be collected 24 seven. Who owns that data? How do we make use of it? How do we predict things like a FICO score for your health? Uh, we're starting to see the advent of sort of check engine light for your body, giving you early warning, like your car check engine light. Um, you know, there's examples of that with the uh, smartwatch being able to pick up the signs of a, a, a flu or maybe pick up COVID even before you know you have it. So really interesting sort of signals coming together with AMI machine learning to make sense of that and give you proactive information. Now, information is power, but it's not going to mean we're going to change our behaviors. We know behavior change is hard. Maybe you have coaches for working outs or corporate. We're seeing now coaching come to data, for example, Lavongo for managing diabetes and now hypertension. Coaches are becoming more and more avatarized, so you can scale AI coaching, which can be hugely impactful. And these coaches will show up in your mirror and start to give you uh, insights about your day that matches what you need to hear about, show you what happens if you smoke two packs a day or if you spend too much time uh, on social media. So lots of new sort of convergences there, which blends into, of course, augmented virtual and extended reality. You know, surgeons now can look through the patient's body and be guided through procedures. You can use augmented reality to teach your kids what's going on inside their own bodies to help them uh, stay healthier. 
Uh, we're using, of course, virtual reality now, not just for putting grandma on a roller coaster, but uh, as therapy, putting pain patients into cold environments to use less than half the pain medicines, or for physical therapy, or for uh, education, like uh, uh, learning heart anatomy in complex ways, or like my friend Shafi in, in, in London has done his live streaming virtual surgeries to 5,000 medical students around the world. So lots of new applications with these technologies, even all the way to kind of building like flight simulators for surgeons or any kind of clinician to go in and practice procedures and kind of get them right over time. So not see one, do one, teach one, but see one and simulate, simulate to so get it right. I'll finish up with two quick things in two minutes. Diagnostics, lots happening in diagnostic space. You can now basically have a, a whole, uh, what used to require an ICU in your pocket. Uh, of course, in COVID, it's been important to use these technologies to monitor patients remotely. Some of you might have some of these remote sort of sensing technologies, kind of like a medical tricorder. So you can not just talk to a clinician on the screen, but leverage a, an AI enabled uh, EKG or ultrasound or a stethoscope. There's now $2,000 powered ultrasounds. I have one not here with, right now, but that can democratize where we do diagnostics anywhere, much lower costs. And laboratories are coming to the chip. You know, you can put a little sensor in your smartphone and uh, bring what used to require a central lab anywhere to any rural clinic or use your smartphone camera as a medical selfie diagnostic. So you dip your urine at home, take a picture with the camera, the results come back to you, your doctor sent to the pharmacy right away. So lots of new ways in diagnostics, particularly important, of course, in COVID, we've had a big fail with rapid COVID testing. We just had the winners of our $6 million rapid COVID testing X prize, lots of new elements that were not just apply towards COVID, but to other infectious diseases or other um, non-infectious diseases. We'll have whole sets of tools in our homes connected to our smartphones for that going forward. Uh, and if there's good examples of this coming together in Africa. A company called Alara Health is building this sort of uh, digital diagnostics toolkit for clinics uh, across Africa. I'll finish up with connecting the dots. All this information now is overwhelming. It's hard to make sense of it. So of course, we don't just need AI, we need IA, intelligence augmentation. It's already starting to play a role in radiology and pathology and dermatology. Even your colonoscopy might start to be enabled with AI. So lesions aren't missed that might have not been seen. And this is going to be, again, a collaboration between human and AI machine learning, not a, not a competition. Uh, in fact, you know, it's going to be the doctor using AI, which will replace the doctor or nurse who doesn't. So uh, we need to pull these things together. Last point will be therapy, tons happening in therapy, but I'll just touch upon, of course, virtual visits have expanded dramatically in the setting of COVID. And the future of telemedicine is not talking to a random doctor or nurse on your smartphone. It's going to first have a, going to talk to a chat bot like Ada or Sydney Care uh, or, or uh, Babylon, uh, which will do smart triage and then up level you to a clinician or digital mental health, which is exploding on the scene. And part of our future of medicine is prescribing apps, whether it's for smoking cessation or diabetes or, uh, uh, or a uh, video game for treating ADHD. I've recently built a platform called digital.health. That's the website, easy to remember, digital.health, which is a bit of a database and a, a formulary of some of these tools and technologies we can start to prescribe to ourselves and to our patients. And we're about to relaunch that. So check out digital.health. If you're a good uh, uh, product manager, come find me, we need one. I'll, I'll uh, leave us with, I'll skip 3D printing and medications. You can watch my TED talk about that. To the last point about discovery, we need to all start to collaborate. Clinical trials used to take 10 years and billions of dollars and half of them would fail. Now we're in an interesting new era of virtualized clinical trials. So it could be an app or a drug or a device. We can test those things virtually, use your home platforms, home sensors. And that means we're really coming to a future of, you know, of crowdsourced health and medicine. Just like we drive with Google Maps and Waze, we're trying to build a, a Waze for healthcare to learn from everybody, build healthcare maps that are local to you and your roads and your condition. And I think that's part of the future of medicine where we're all data donors going forward. So in summary, the future of Health, medicine, global health, I think is bright. If we think exponentially, we think convergently layering these technologies together. If we think not just about where we are in 2021, but where the puck is going in 2025, 2030, tremendous opportunities if you leverage where these things are heading uh, in smart ways. And together, we can really move and paradigm shift from our sort of era of sick care to true health care, from episodic and intermittent to continuous and proactive, from physical to increasingly virtualized, to one size fits all meds, to more personalized, that could be an app, a, a drug, to you know, really starting to enable the provider using crowdsourced information that's enhanced with AI machine learning. And of course, using smarter incentives and building better systems uh, going forward. So with that, I encourage you all to take exponential steps, not linear ones and uh, build, the future of, uh, build the future of health and medicine uh, uh, collaborative together. So thanks. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Thanks. Thank you so much for, for sharing all this information.
Fantastic. Um, just so you know, um, this session is recorded, so I will for sure share with you the recording afterwards. Slow motion. Exactly. Slow motion. This is really power hour style. Uh, love it. Um, I have a bunch of questions prepared, but I really want to give the uh, the share voice to the to the community. So please speak up if you have questions to Daniel. Now we take the next five minutes for this. Who wants to go first? Anyone? Just unmute yourself. Well, while people are getting brave to ask a question, I mean, yeah. one thing I'd encourage you all to do is like, just, you know, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So don't wait for some of the things to arrive. If you see a pain point, a challenge, you might find an app for that that already exists. You might help invent one or build one or 3D print a solution with your down the street neighbor. So it's a really interesting time, uh, number one, to find what's already out there and help popularize it. If you have hypertension, try getting a connected blood pressure cuff on Amazon and sharing that data with your doctor, whether they want to or not start getting them into this new world and start demanding kind of the uberization of healthcare, connecting the dots, making it less friction. So there's a lot of opportunity not to, you know, wait for new things to arrive, but to leverage already here. And part of the challenge is getting these new tech and solutions integrated into actual clinical care, paid for, regulated, et cetera. I like your question. Um, oh, sorry, Alan, go ahead. oh, sorry, Alan is speaking. Um, more, more than a question, it's, um, it's probably half a statement. Actually, if I understand well, the, uh, the whole project is to make medicine go back to what it was probably three or four thousand years ago in China. I mean, the, in the old China, you did pay your doctor as long as you were in good health and uh, you stopped paying when you were sick. And he was he was in charge of bringing you back uh, to, uh, to, to to the right health. Um, how do you see the uh, attitude of people? Are they going to be prepared to pay as long as they're in good health? And and what will be what will be the change? I mean, in, in the behavior, because actually we pay when we are sick today. Is there a way to reverse that? Yeah, great question. That's a great example. I often use that. Yeah, uh, the ancient Chinese doctors would pay would only be paid when you're when you're well. And that's starting to happen, you know, it, and many of you live in, in Europe and, you know, NHS and other socialized systems, essentially, they don't uh, make more money when you get sick. Their incentives are hopefully to keep you healthier. Many of the new systems in the United States, which are no longer fee for service, they get a capitated amount, a certain amount of dollars per patient, let's say $1,000 per patient. And they're incentivized to not have to use that with an intensive care unit visit or emergency room visit. So, and, and, pay, and physicians, in a sense, are, are going to start getting paid only when you're well and maybe kind of dinged if you keep showing up in the emergency room. So it's all about aligning incentives and those are different, just like politics is very local. It might be very different for different healthcare systems. Um, so we need to think smartly about how we do that. Do we pay for prevention? So for example, that urinalysis uh, dipstick can screen for early renal failure, you know, on home, at your home with a smartphone, would you pay, you know, $7 for that test? Or would you, you know, wait for folks to develop kidney failure need a dialysis, which is much more expensive. So one dialysis or kidney transplant, the million plus dollars paid for that can be used to prevent, you know, 100 patients from ever getting complications or maybe even diabetes in the first place. So we need to really shift where the dollars go and, and the focus. No, I mean, it comes with a true revolution in, in a social security system because we're paying a fortune in the Western world, at least, or in the developed world, at least, um, just to cover sickness. So uh, the question is, how are we going to make people pay to be in good health, uh, how uh, what what will be the willingness to pay upfront instead of waiting for the moment where where they will become sick? Yeah, I mean, it also comes down to the individual level. Maybe your insurance premium is going to be lower if you show that you're walking ten thousand steps a day and you're taking your yoga and your meditation and you quit smoking. So sometimes it can come down to the very individual who might have to pay more personally if they're doing private insurance, uh, all the way to you know the the social power because health is social. And if you if your friends 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 are obese, you're more likely to be obese. So there's this whole complicated design element and connective elements that are going to push the needle towards the prevention and wellness side and to pay for that, which eventually should, you know, we have like in the US, 19% of our GDP, and that's climbing in Europe and many parts of the world. So we need to really move that thing down. And, and COVID, again, has been a, a catalyst to show that folks who didn't have good health care to start with were the ones who suffered the most and are costing uh, the most in terms of mortality and morbidity. Thank you. A very inspiring presentation. Thank you. All right, we've time for one more question. Anyone? Otherwise, I have one to speak up. I'm happy to oh. go. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel, for that for that firework of innovation. Um, so this all runs on health data, and and the obvious question now is who, who you said it, who owns that data, and 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 if you go further, who profits from that data, and how can we avoid mistakes that we've made in the past with other data, where there's actually a profit to be made or a benefit to be had from the data, but 
the individual that's sharing the data doesn't get to get uh, whatever kind of return comes out of it. And then there are technical possibilities to do this differently with health data and then also incentivize people say, my genome is super interesting because I have this or that condition. Is there an incentive monetarily for me to share the data to then improve research and other things uh, for other people out there? Any thoughts you have on that? Yeah, great question. There's a lot to dig into there. I mean, you know, data sort of wants to be free, I, and especially in healthcare, it's often very siloed in systems that don't talk to each other, medical records, imaging, genomics, digital. And uh, I, I, I believe we should, should own our own healthcare data and have the option to hopefully share it, but be incentivized to do that. It may not be through getting paid for sharing your genome, but to get insights back, just like when we drive with Google Maps uh, or Waze, we're sharing our speed and location. It's pretty private data, but then we get data back that helps us drive to work or miss the speed trap. So I think when folks see that they can, number one, share data anonymously, so we need to use blockchain and other technologies to help make sure folks know it can be secure. It's never gonna be perfect, but I'll also be going to the fear side. I mean, GDPR or HIPAA, you know, many patients have died with their privacy intact who might have been alive with some privacy uh, concerns if we could have moved their medical information from one hospital clinic or from their Fitbit <laughs> in, in other ways. So we need to think smartly about um, letting folks choose how to share and where to share, but also to, again, incentivize that. And it's not always going to be dollars, but in some cases you might, you know, uh, get a free wearable or other elements if that data is shared. That already happens with things like 23andMe, which is making a beta business model on crowdsourced genetic information, now developing drugs and other insights. So it's complex. I think we need not, not to go too far into the fear factor side and be smarter about how do we um, share it, because that's what really the progress happens. Great. Thank you. Brilliant. Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, absolutely amazing. Um, great to have you with us here in the community. Thanks for sharing all your wisdom. Um, yeah. All right, we're moving on to the, to the next speaker. Just let me share again the screen here. There we go. All right. You should see the screen again. That works, right? All right, perfect. So now uh, let's move on to our final speaker of tonight. Vete is the co-founder of the listed green hydrogen company, Enaptor, that will, uh, and she will tell us a bit more about like, what they're working on, as well as the opportunity for you to join green hydrogen. Uh, a flagship event they're running on May 19, a special event actually to discover trailblazing hydrogen technologies. Another big topic we've heard uh, quite some stuff about before. All right, Vitea, the stage is yours. Here you go. Yeah, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, and yeah, super interesting, Daniel. Much appreciated uh, and enjoyed that uh, yeah, very energizing talk. So thanks for that. Um, yeah, moving on to another innovation. Uh, ours is uh, in green hydrogen. So Anaptor is an electrolyzer manufacturer. This is one of our devices. It's today the size of about of a microwave. And essentially its purpose is to take renewable energy, excess renewables, for example, and uh, take that electricity, have a water input as well, and then use the electricity to split the water into H2 and O2. The oxygen is then released and then the hydrogen is uh, stored in the tank or used directly depending uh, on the use case. So our mission is to drive down the cost of green hydrogen to replace fossil fuels uh, ASAP. And um, maybe on the, yeah, the next slide we can see, uh, yeah, why are we talking about green hydrogen and uh, why is it a relevant topic for us today? Well, um, when we look at our global energy consumption, 30% uh, of it could be electrified, whereas 70% uh, still uh, would need an alternative hydrocarbon and wouldn't be satisfied with, um, uh, with electricity. So uh, this is where we understand, okay, then hydrogen is an alternative fuel and it can then be used in all of our sectors, in mobility, in heat, in industry, as well as in energy. So when we think of hydrogen, we can think of energy storage, but we can also go into the applications such as uh, decarbonizing the aviation sector uh, or the shipping sector, um, as well as uh, our, our, our heating, for example. And then all of these uh, industrial processes that we might not be thinking about, for example, um, steel manufacturing or glass making. Um, we uh, are emitting a lot of CO2 today and we need to find alternatives to, to, to stop that uh, this, this habit, let's say. Um, and then in the next slide, we can kind of see a, a, yeah, an, an image to understand how our uh, electrolyzer works and also where it fits in the supply chain of green hydrogen. So we're sitting right at the beginning of the supply chain um, 
and uh, enabling different uh, sectors, as mentioned before, to uh, yeah to switch to an alternative fuel. Um, I think the next slide is a good indication of just some of the visuals and the use cases of our um, yeah from our customers and our partners. So Anaptor is a, a technology provider. So we focus on scaling up the production of our systems. Uh, recently announced the campus that we will be building in uh, North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. And uh, we work with um, system integrators and uh, engineering procurement construction companies and other larger industrial players uh, by providing them modular systems. So yeah, just a, a quick run through uh, seasonal storage, for example, as uh, hydrogen is a, a fantastic candidate for long term energy storage. As you can see, uh, the image uh, towards the center left is um, and the bottom covered with snow. And so these solar panels wouldn't be able to generate uh, clean electricity. And this is when uh, the hydrogen would then kick in and provide over um, five days of autonomy in this uh, chalet in the Alps. So that's just one of the use cases. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe some of the more, more flashy ones on the uh, bottom right with uh, the Hyperion hypercar, which is uh, yeah, a pretty, pretty sexy car, let's say, uh, from uh, our, our partners in uh, Los Angeles. And then also um, working with uh, Zero Avia based out of uh, the UK and also with some base in, uh, in the States. And um, the, the role we're playing here is providing an electrolyzer that generates green hydrogen on site um, to refuel these, uh, the, their engines, which uh, in the end is a question of cost, right? It's more cost effective if you can just generate your fuel uh, on site at the airport, for example, uh, instead of uh, going through the whole supply chain and here making use of abundant, hopefully abundant sun in the UK, but at least abundant wind uh, and uh, generating yeah, their own electricity, their own um, fuel. So lots of use cases, um, but I think what we also wanted to chat about today was Generation Hydrogen, which is a non-commercial event we are hosting online on May 19th, so coming up really, really quickly. And our idea here is to um, uh, bring together all those excited about green hydrogen and also bring together the experts in green hydrogen to talk about the technology. Because if you've heard something about green hydrogen, it's probably about where the market is going and the economics about it and all this, talk, uh, but no one's talking about the, the hardware and the technology. And we wanted to really showcase who are these teams pushing forward um, uh, this future in green hydrogen. It's a full day event and uh, everyone's invited, it's free. And uh, it's all about the, yeah, the technologies, whether it's uh, solar, uh, solar food uh, protein production with hydrogen or uh, bringing back steam for mobility. Uh, it's gonna be, Quite a quite a quick event, uh, quick content, but uh, lots of nuggets of information. Of course, networking opportunities, and everyone's invited. So hope to see some familiar faces there. That's fantastic. Thanks, Thanks that's so, it, so huh? much for that. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that, that that's it. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Vaitia is Perfect. also available on on Slack, obviously, and uh, you can also talk to her here, also on the chat. You just just ping her. If you want an introduction, so on, also easy going. We'll share this information for sure and the link and so on to Generation Hydrogen as well on Slack. Uh, upcoming e happenings that are coming now on the 20th, uh, we have the book launch of the actually the German version of the Fight Back Now book is coming out. It's called Das Entscheidende Jahrzehnt. On the 22nd, we have the Earth Day campaign. So please get Earthified as mentioned before. And uh, on May 20th, we have actually the next Fight Back Power Hour coming up. And I hope to see you all there again. So with this, I wish you a wonderful evening and uh, yeah, have a great weekend coming up and thanks so much for joining and take care. Stay healthy. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Tim. Thank, Thank you, Tim. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Thanks Tim. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you guys. Bye. Have a nice weekend.